Now, here is Lou Augusta. Hi, this is Lou Augusta, and welcome to A Rumor of Empathy. Today, my special guest is Misha Zupko. Celebrated Chicago-based composer Misha Zupko writes music that is emotionally charged, viscerally engaging, and continually seeks to involve participation on a variety of levels. In the words of the New York Times, Misha has created a body of work that is intensely virtuosic and speaks with a clarity of vision. In the words of New York Times critic Anthony Tomasini, Zupko's five etudes for piano are list-like in their florid generosity, and the LA Times has hailed his compositions. Misha's works have been featured at Carnegie Hall, the Harris Theater of Music and Dance in Chicago, Ravinia, Minneapolis Orchestra Hall, the Aspen Music Festival, the Moscow Conservatory, the Dame Myra Hess Series, the American Modern Ensemble Concert Series, Keys to the Future, and Bang on a Can Summer Music Festival. Welcome to the show, Misha. Thank you. Thank you, Lou. It's, it's great that you can be here and we could do this thing together. So I, to get started, let's jump right into it. What are you working on? Um, this year has brought about quite a variety of different projects for me, which has been uh, really exciting. Um, at the current moment, I'm just finishing up work on a CD that I'm recording with Sadie Records uh, that features uh, myself on piano, uh, violinist Sang Mi Lee, and cellist Wendy Warner. Um, we're doing a collection of my works for various combinations of those instruments. And some of the works I actually wrote for uh, those particular soloists uh, to kind of bring the album together as a concept album. Um, so we've done a lot of the recording for that, and I've done a lot of the writing for that this year. But in addition, um, right now I'm working on a choral piece that's for the final event of uh, something we call Make Music Chicago, a day-long event that involves the entire Chicago community in music making. And the final event is usually some you know, kind of big outrageous uh, project. And this year what we're doing is we're doing a choir piece dedicated to fathers because it coincides with Father's Day. Mm -hmm. And the piece is going to uh, take place all over the city where different sections of the choir are going to be dropped at different points in the city and synchronized via an iPhone application that will allow them to all be singing at the same time, but then they will walk towards uh, our Maggie Daly Park and uh, where the piece will ultimately be realized. I mean, you're blowing my mind. <laughs> so, uh, you know, so my, I mean, two thoughts. Uh, first of all, you're infusing the community with a musical event. Exactly. It's and, an immersion experience. And, yeah. and so that, I'm, I'm enthusiastic. I'm, I'm inspired. <clears throat> I mean, I'm... I'm I'm moved, and so how? Um, tell me about. I, how did this come about? What? How do you? How do you make something like this happen? <laughs> it, it's always a, a strange confluence of things coming together. I've I've worked pretty extensively with Make Music Chicago in the past, or at least have had you know some performances on on at their various venues in years past. Um, I'm also working with a wonderful lady, uh, Genevieve Thiers, who is not only an a unimaginably great soprano, um, but is also an entrepreneur. Uh, she developed a company called SitterCity.com. Uh, so she's you know, a dot-com uh, entrepreneur. But say the name again. <clears throat> Genevieve Thiers. And, and the somethingcity.com? SitterCity.com. So like Sitter? Like babysitter. Okay. Yes. okay. SitterCity.com. <laughs> okay. She's in the, she was <clears throat> actually one of the first uh, websites to offer uh, care to people through the internet. Huh. Um, and Well, heavens knows, we, we all need good uh, daycare <laughs> for our children. I mean, this is a major challenge. If you have good daycare, then you can have a, kind of try to have a life. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm, I'm sure she was thinking about all of her artist colleagues as well when she was developing this. <laughs> I see. And so, and so, you know, once again, necessity is the mother of invention, Absolutely. literally in this case. Absolutely, yeah. yes. And so, she, so she's one of the uh, well, she, movers she, and shakers. So right. She, she directs uh, an opera company called Opera Moda. And 
Make Music Chicago teamed up with Opera Moda to try to develop this project. Well, I w- I've worked with Make Music Chicago in the past, as I've explained, and I also work with Genevieve. We're together writing a musical based on the Everly Sisters, uh, mm-hmm. a couple of famous madams who existed mm-hmm. here in Chicago at the turn of the century. Mm-hmm. So our working relationship obviously was a part of, of this mm-hmm. commission to do this I as see. Well. Inter- now, let me digress. When you say the Everly Sisters were a couple of famous madams here in Chicago, <laughs> are we talking about, uh, I, I'm looking for the right euphemism at this point, but uh, are we talking about uh, exchanging money for sex? Is oh, what? yes, we are. I see. <laughs> and so this would be in the sort of the glory days of, uh, if uh, I don't know, I want to say Al Capone, I mean, gangster, it, it was, or, it or was even a, before that, perhaps. It was, it was before that time, yeah. yeah. This was right at the turn of the century. 1901 was when the Everly sisters made their way to uh, Chicago in a Pullman train. Um, yes. And they basically were looking to change the game of vice. They, I see. You know, we, we had a pretty lewd uh, red light district yeah. and a lot of women were being abused through that system. And having been brought up in that system themselves, they were trying to find a way to make it tenable for for women. I'm amazed. I mean, because this could have rich comic possibilities, or it, it could does. go. It could go in a significant and serious direction, which you just indicated, right. and, and possibly both. I mean, both have got to be in the space once you bring it up. No, it, and absolutely, yeah. that's the balance that we've yeah. we've been trying to strike. We've we had a reading at Stage Seven Seven Three in Chicago um, hmm. on Belmont Avenue hmm. that was. Open to the public, and and you know Genevieve pulled out all the stops in order that you know it wouldn't just be a reading; it would be almost like a staged reading. Yeah. Um. And we got a lot of amazing feedback from that session, and it, you know I've I've heard from a number of people, and this is definitely true that you know the hardest thing in the world is to get a musical off the ground. You have to go through so many revisions and rewrites, and so we're we're in that phase now, trying to strike that very important balance between. You know what is a very serious subject matter and has a lot of contemporary relevance, but is also filled with the the comedy that is associated with kind of the gangster lives of. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's got possibilities as burlesque. I mean, I think, and in fact, you, you burlesque know. is a major part of this. Yeah. We're, we're involving Michelle Lamore, who is hmm. one of the most famous burlesque artists here in Chicago. I mean, this is so rich. I mean, and you know, we can even make the connection with classic music. A Marriage of Figaro has Count <laughs> Alma Viva chasing Cherubino around the couch, and Absolutely. every time every time he opens the door, out pops his page. <laughs> Carabino, who's like flirting with his wife and with everybody in the picture. <laughs> and so the comic possibilities are front and center. Oh, abso- yeah. no, absolutely. Yeah. And I mean, I think theater has always been about, you know, a, a reflection of society or a reflection of values of some sort, you know, with, mm-hmm. with you know, serious opera in, in the early days, you know, it was it was all about reflecting high morals, and so they would draw from the ancient Greeks and the and the the Roman you know war heroes and 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 the yeah. you know magnanimous rulers to to try to you know have an esteemed moral virtue to you know to follow in these things. But I mean, a lot of opera and and musicals have been really about society and about people and yeah. and and what drives it. Well, and so. So you're engaged on a number of different levels and yeah. a number of fronts. Everything, you know, not to everything from burlesque, but much of your music, I mean, and much of your music is serious and significant. And uh, Yeah, uh, I, I mean, I, I come from a uh, classical upbringing. My, my father is a composer, um, and I started as a classical pianist um, okay. from the age of three. I remember, you know, listening to my dad play, you know, yeah. on our piano at home, the, you know, elements of the well-tempered clavier and, you know, having certain preludes uh, and fugues from that that I was especially fond of. And, and that drove me to want to to do this. Do yeah. you remember the first time you sat down at a, key, at a keyboard, the piano, and what happened? No, I don't remember the first time because that would have been... Do you remember any time? <laughs> <laughs> Let me rephrase it. Do you remember having any early regular? <laughs> you know, it, it's funny. With me, memory is, a, is a, a very kind of fleeting and returning type of thing. I sometimes 
you know, have trouble remembering what I did yesterday. And, and then, you know, the next day it will come back to me, you know, as bold as if it, you know, was happening in the moment. And the same thing with distant memories too. So I, I would say, you know, my most distant memories are of my piano in my room. It was, you know, an old blonde colored upright piano that, you know, was against the, the um, might have been the uh, south wall of our room. And, you know, I could go right from bed to the piano. I could, you know, be in my PJs playing the piano and go right to bed. Yeah. Um, you know, it was something that was always there, that was always present. Uh, and almost so you part. did have talent from an, I mean, from an early age. Well, I at mean, least I had training and you, desire. You had, you, had, <laughs> you had engagement with the subject, and of some course. dare call it talent. And by the, I acknowledge memory is overrated. You know, yeah. memory is overrated. It's uh, right experience, it, but you know, yeah. yeah. But nevertheless, sometimes you know, it has its uses. Now, I'm, I'm wondering, you know, we have queued up a couple of pieces by you yes. so to give our listeners a sense of what you're by. I wonder if you would be kind enough to introduce the first selection, I want to say Eclipse. Absolutely. Yeah, and yeah. then I will get that played. Sure. Well, Eclipse is actually uh, one of the pieces that I wrote for the CD that's going to be coming out on Sadie Records. And this is a piece for violin and cello. Uh, I wrote it for the two uh, beautiful performers that you're going to hear, Wendy Warner and Sang Me Lee. And this was performed at the Sadie's annual benefit for their, their company. Um, and the piece is very literally an eclipse. Um, and it, it came about, the, the title and the concept came about through actually my collaboration with these two wonderful performers. So I was writing this piece where I had formulated a, a way of overlapping the two parts in such a way that you would hear maybe the violin start a line, but the cello then joins and finishes that line. And so there would be a certain segment of the two that would overlap by a certain amount. And my process was to have those parts completely overlap by a certain point in the piece. And the violinist said to me one day, she's like, oh my gosh, that's just like an eclipse. And it dawned on me, oh my God, this is exactly the the kind of sentiment that I was trying to reach to this you know this kind of awe inspired night sky where you're witnessing a, a a cosmic event that only comes along once every so often okay so it's a rare coincidence of cello and violin and uh, I'm gonna so uh, cue up and play the piece Thank you. 
Welcome back. So, any that's Eclipse. Yes. Your thoughts, Misha? Well, this is a piece that is uh, actually written as part of a series of pieces uh, that I mentioned that I'm writing for the soloists that all have to do with cosmic phenomena. So, um, I'm really exploring ideas of process of these kind of slowly moving processes. And in this case, it was, you know, a slowly moving process toward the, the, uh, the alignment of the cello and the violin. And in other pieces, I explore other processes. I see. So hold that thought. We're going to go to a break and we'll continue talking about Eclipse and your other compositions when we come back. My special guest today is Misha Zupko, musician, teacher, composer. We'll be right back. Now, back to the program. This is Lou Augusta. Welcome back to A Rumor of Empathy. My special guest today is Misha Zupko, musician, teacher, composer. Before the break, we heard Eclipse. Yes. And we were talking about that. Uh, any further thoughts about the music of the spheres? <laughs> <laughs> well, it, yeah, it's it, it really... I've always been fascinated by cosmic events, you know, ever since I was little. I think my first aspiration was to be an astronaut, actually, and I'm kind of getting back there now as it is. Um, <laughs> but um, what what I find so fascinating about the, the cosmos is the seeming disorder of it, but yet there is such order and calculation that at least we can discern, you know, through, you know, modern sciences. And there is a process in place that couldn't exist without the exact balances of certain forces. Um, And so it's those processes, those slowly moving processes that I'm so fascinated by and that I think can make a tangible link between what is seen and what is heard. Um, so often music can be, you know, kind of an abstract uh, experience and, you know, it's supposed to mean this uh, and yet every listener hears it or feels it or imagines it in a different way. And I, I love to allow for that, you know, that possibility of a multitude of different uh, interpretations of an idea. But at the same time, I like to be able to get a strong idea across and in something like Eclipse where you know, the whole idea was this these converging lines that eventually wind up together. And so you can't see one behind the other. You can't hear one behind the other. They're one simultaneous unit is very much like the experience of watching an eclipse. Um, that's a very deep thought and I think significant for a number of reasons. Uh, I mean, the early astronomers, Kepler, right? I mean, right. he's figuring out that the Earth goes around the sun, not as a circle, but as an ellipse. He was a mathematician, right. and he had big data, actually, yeah. uh, collected by his teacher Tycho Brahe there mm-hmm. in the observatory in Czechoslovakia or right. wherever, <laughs> Prague, I think it was. Uh, and uh, yeah, he was committed. I mean, he, you know, it, it was imaginary, right, that each planet has its own, so, if not melody, at least its own set of musical signatures, I would want to say. Right. And so you're just... I I mean, you're running with the ball here as, as a metaphor. And uh, I mean, and, and, and so, I mean, and, but here's the point, maybe here's the point from the point of view of, of mathematics and music. I, you know, I've heard, I am, uh, you know, I love music. I'm an avid listener. I'm not a musician, but I have heard that mathematicians tend to be good at music. Musicians often tend to be good at mathematics if they're interested right. in the subject. Right. And you know, you're, this kind of points to what's going on there. Yeah. Uh, no, no, no. Say more about that if you well, can. Well, there's, you know, I definitely have a proclivity towards mathematics and the sciences. Yeah. Um, you know, those were, were among my stronger areas growing up. Um, I, I cannot claim to have any, you know, wondrous mathematical abilities at this point in my life just simply because I'm about 25 years away from algebra. <laughs> but... Um, <laughs> And, 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 you know, I may express my sympathies or, or delight at this thought. You know, congratulations, <laughs> survived algebra. That's right. Yeah. Well, no, I mean, you yeah. know, and I, I did, you know, I went through like calculus too and in, yeah, in, in well. college. And I mean, I, I always enjoyed the, 
the perfection of yeah. mathematics in a way. And in fact, you know, it, it's not high level math, but I am using mathematics in the creation of these pieces. I'm, I'm actually plotting them out on Excel charts. Hmm. Um, and so uh, oftentimes what I do is once I get the idea down, maybe the first phrase, the first musical phrase, I start to analyze that musical phrase in terms of how many beats of, of are there, is there music playing? How many beats are rest? Um, I may look at how many notes within a group. Mm-hmm. And then I, I basically uh, plot all of those in an Excel chart and I start to manipulate those, you know, using certain additive and subtractive uh, processes, which allow me, but it's not just a random act of, of additive and subtractive processes. It's actually formulated so that I come out with a certain result at a certain time. So, you know, I'm figuring all of this stuff in time. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm fascinated because we get some insight here into how you work into the creative process. I mean, right. And from the point of view of the history of music, which I know, you know, a, a little bit about, full disclosure, <laughs> I'm an avid amateur, right? And it does sound a bit like what Arnold Schoenberg was doing with the 12-tone <laughs> method. And I wonder, I mean, that, that itself... So, is it? I mean, what, is it some variation? What's going on well, there? Well, with, with the 12-tone method, what, what Schoenberg was really seeking to do is to eradicate any sense of a tonal center, meaning, mm, yeah. you know, we shouldn't recognize any pitch as more important than another pitch. Mm. Now, what that means to the average listener is you don't hear things in keys. <laughs> there, there is not the key yeah. of C major. There is not yeah. the key of G minor. Yeah. Um, and so it's a challenge to it, the. It's a, it can be very challenging. It, it can to, be. A, a, yeah. It can be a great challenge. Yeah. But as history has taught us, every innovation has been a challenge. Yeah. Look, I mean, Monteverdi was a challenge to yes. the people in his time. I mean, yeah. critics were calling him out on using all these unresolved dissonances, as they called them. You know, yeah. and probably some of the same comments would have been made about Schoenberg. You know, at the beginning of the the 20th century, and, and oh, were made by the way. And were, yeah. It may be ongoing. It may be an ongoing process. <laughs> well, it, it is yeah. indeed ongoing. Yeah. You know, I I still you know sometimes I curate uh, concerts and I always field questions and and try to have discussions with people after the concerts and you know undoubtedly one of the hardest things for people to deal with is unresolved dissonance. Yeah. Well, you know, it. I must say, I'm going to jump right in here because. Yeah. The title of this show, of the series, is A Rumor of Empathy. And the main, you know, I'm talking too much to be <laughs> totally authentically empathic. To be, to, to, to be empathic, one has to be quiet and listen. Mm. And the thing about music is it's a challenge to one's listening. So we're, we're doing great with Monteverdi. He's got traction and got validated along right. with the Beethoven, Mozart, Haydn, Mozart, Beethoven, and Brahms. Right. Those guys, those, they're kind of enormous contributions. Right. And even so, there, you know, there can be challenges to a listening here with some of the newer, quote unquote, modern right. music, to use that phrase. It's a challenge to our listening, and maybe we should engage the challenge and stretch our listening and, and inform our humanity at that level. Well, I. I've often had this conversation with, you know, lots of colleagues, you know, about, you know, what is it that a new piece of music that may be bristly or may be difficult on a first listen is such a repulsion for new audiences? Why, why does that close the door on the experience? And, you know, the, the result that we've all, or the, at least the, the idea that we've all come to is that music is such a visceral um, art form. We receive it and we react to it immediately. And you know what? Mm-hmm. If there's a 15 minute piece happening in a concert hall, you're probably not going to feel obliged to leave in the middle of it. You know, I, you know, I mean, you may want to, but it's going to be, you know, hard to do that. And so you're kind of stuck with that experience for 15 minutes or it could be longer. Mm-hmm. Um, and that can feel very, you know, like being put out to a certain, to a certain extent. But what what I discovered in my teaching days at Indiana University when I was a, a graduate assistant there, I had this class of uh, composer minors. They, well, not minors. They were actually electives. Okay. Um, and we would teach some of them. That and, means a lesser subject, not somebody under 18, right? I mean, <laughs> right. Uh, uh, no, no, no. It, ba- uh, it basically uh, uh, means they're, they're doing it as an elective. They're, okay, not, they're not doing it yeah. to major in it. Yeah. But I, you know, part of that class was you would teach the students individually, give them private lessons in composition so they'd work on their compositions. 
the other part of this is we would come together as a class and we would, you know, listen to music of the past hundred years and, you know, even music as recent as the past year. Um, and we would, you know, try to put some framework around all of it. Well, in the individual lessons, I had a, a young man come to me and, and he told me first thing, I really want to write music, but I don't want to write new music. And I said, that's going to be very difficult because if you write it today, it's going to be new. And, <laughs> By know, definition, of he, course. He, and he, yeah. said, he said, well, of course, but you know, you know what I mean. Yeah. You know? and, and so we all know what somebody means when yeah. they, you know, there's a rejection of the new in, in terms of music. And it got me to thinking, and I, I, I asked him a, a question. I said, well, what do you listen to music for? What purpose does it serve? And he gave me a number of different reasons. Well, you know, it can be motivational. It can, you know, if I'm, it can help me to stay awake when I'm studying. It can help calm me down at night, you know. So there were all these. And it can inspire me. And it, it can, can inspire. If I'm working out, I want something with an upbeat as opposed to exactly. a Gregorian chant, which, you know, which I love. I right. love and, and yet they kind of relaxes me in that. So what I realized was the undergirding principle of all of this is people need content text for a listening experience. So what I did with my class, which was an interesting experience, I played them a couple of, of clips from famous movies. Uh, Altered States was one of them, the movie from the 80s with William Hurt, and then Space Odyssey 2001, the Stanley Kubrick uh, icon. Um, and I played two-minute fragments of each one of those, and they obviously had musical score underneath both of them that were pretty wild and modern, and, and the students were so engaged with the process of talking about how the music supported these, you know, these visions of, of William Hurt as he was experiencing a high on peyote mushrooms or, yeah. you know, the, the flight into deep space that, you know, was supposed to simulate almost like time travel in Space Odyssey 2001. And it was supported by a, a score that just had, you know, like these screechy violins and, and they, but they, they all commented on how apropos these, these, this music was for those particular scenes. Well, then I proceeded proceeded to play them two excerpts of music unrelated to film. And I got the usual comments. Oh, this is so dissonant. Oh, it's so horrible. I can't listen to this. And the revelation was that those two musical clips were the exact same clips that I had played with the videos. Ding, ding, ding. Yeah. I mean, that's, a, that's a, an insight and practically a breakthrough. Right. Yeah. It's, 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 it goes so directly to our emotionality and to our, right. our, our feelings and affects. And if, if we have an emotional or cinematic or visual context for a music, then we feel comfortable. But if we don't, we feel uncomfortable. If music is played just in the abstract, you know, just for the pleasure of listening – then we either need a context that has to do with our memory of some fond thing that happened or some, you know, or we need to have some other type of reference for it. So create the context for our next musical in, uh, excerpt, uh, your composition, Pilatus. Sure. Well, this was uh, an orchestral piece that I wrote for uh, Chicago Camerata, which is a chamber orchestra that operates here in Chicago, obviously. Um, and they were doing a European tour back in 2012, and the director approached me and said, we'd like to commission a piece. And so, you know, that was an exciting venture, and I knew I was going to be going on the tour with them. So um, I fortunately uh, secured a residency in Lucerne, Switzerland the year before, and so this gave me a perfect opportunity uh, to work for three weeks without any interruptions in the midst of some of the most beautiful landscape you can imagine. So, of course, you know, the, the, the immediate surroundings were going to influence uh, the direction that this piece was going to take. And, you know, a chamber orchestra usually doesn't perform a whole lot of modern works. Now, I, I can't say that unequivocally, but uh, oftentimes they're relegated to music that was written from, you know, the high classical period, which is, you know, the end of the 18th century and before. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, the idea of, of throwing a completely avant-garde work at them was not something that I wanted to, to necessarily explore. And so I wanted to explore something of a more romantic notion. Mm -hmm. um, and so what I did is I literally took... Mount Pilatus, which is kind of the central landscape of Lucerne. And I took, you know, a, a 
wonderful hike there. It was actually a reunion hike. I had been there 20 years before, but um, I was by myself this time. I could just explore the place Mm -hmm. extensively. And I wanted to translate the feelings that, you know, came very naturally just from, you know, the awe of of traveling around this mountain. But I also took some of the legends and myths around this that had to do with dragons and actually Pontius Pilate rising from the lake in Lucerne. (laughs) There shall be dragons. So with that, so you were inspired. With that, please cue up and play Pilatus. And so that is an excerpt from Pilatus by composer Misha Zubko. As he was saying uh, before we had the uh, excerpt, the experiences that he was inspired to experience by Mount Pilatus in the vicinity of Lucerne. Now we're up against a break and we're going to take that break. And when we come back, we're going to debrief and discuss Pilatus further My special guest today is Misha Zubko, musician, teacher, composer. We'll be right back. Lou Augusta is one of the premier educators and empathy consultants in action in the community today. As the author of three books on empathy and a Ph.D. from the University of Chicago Philosophy Department on Empathy and Interpretation, Lou provides three services. Empathy Consulting and Education, in which he coaches individuals and organizations on how to expand the results they are getting in their life, business, or organization by expanding their empathy. Individual Psychotherapy Services, to help with recovery from trauma or other confronting personal issues, where Lou's commitment is to provide a gracious and generous listening as providing access to shifting out of resignation into engagement, action, and accomplishment and delivering the empathy training seminar and workshop for groups where the participants get access to the deep infrastructure of empathy. For further details, see Lou on the web at louagusta.com. That is spelled L-O-U-A-G-O-S-T-A or phone 773-203-0269. Again, louagusta.com, or phone 773-203-0269. You are listening to A Rumor of Empathy. To reach Lou Augusta or his guest today, 
please call in to 1-888-346-9141. That's 1-888-346-9141. You may also send an email to a rumor of empathy at gmail.com. Now, back to the program. This is Lou Augusta. Welcome back to A Rumor of Empathy. My special guest today is Misha Zupko, musician, teacher, composer. Before the break, we heard an excerpt from Misha's composition, Pilatus. Say more about it. Well, as I mentioned, I, I think this is a very, you know, kind of neo-romantic piece for me in that it it's a very direct emotional expression. And, you know, listening to this one isn't necessarily supposed to envision a mountain if they didn't know that that was the point of inspiration. But, you know, obviously the feelings that are associated with walking on a, a majestic landscape like this are a common experience uh, for, for all of us. And hearing music like that can certainly conjure that, you know, emotional center uh, for us. And so, I mean, that's, you know, whenever I, I try to write a piece of music, I try to think in terms of what is the 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 takeaway from this what you know i mean not everybody's going to get this but what is everybody going to at least be able to understand or how can i best communicate uh, an idea well that's way? what made me think that it would be engaging to have you on the show misha mm-hmm. music speaks directly to our emotions yeah. and you you made a nice point before the break that uh, you take uh, a screechy violin piece and you put it into uh Deep Space, or an, you didn't say an Alfred Hitchcock movie, but there's a certain amount <laughs> oh, of there's angst. That too. <laughs> there's a certain amount of angst, which he is a genius in capturing. Mm-hmm. And it works. It works right. for the audience. It's appropriate. They get it. In fact, without the music, they don't even get the same message. Right. And that, but you take that out of context and put it in a concert hall and give it a fancy name and say it's by <laughs> Arnold Schoenberg. And there are a number of people who immediately are in reaction to that. Right. And so. You know, the challenge here is to to stretch our comfort zone just a bit and, and thereby take our listening up a level or two. Well, I, I think that's exactly it, because I think ultimately most people's associations with music are is that music is supposed to make them feel better in some way. Okay. You know, it, yeah. it, it, it can be a panacea for, for a lot of things. And there's nothing wrong with that. It certainly does. I know a number of times I have gone to certain pieces of music to make myself feel better. Um, but music expresses so much more. It expresses all sides of a person. It, it expresses the creative potential of a human being. It expresses uh, values and ideas of our time. Um, and it, it's it's so much more than just you know kind of a background element to our lives, but it really is kind of the fabric of our lives expressed in such a way that you know at the heart of it nobody can mistake its meaning. You know, it's 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 and, universal. And so the recommendation I'm going to kind of give try to give you back what I think I heard you saying. Sure. And then you can tell me whether I got it or not. Rather than Listen for the thunderstorm in Mm -hmm. Beethoven's Pastoral Symphony with crash bang and cymbals and drums, or listen for the bird tweeting after the rain has ended. Yes, I mean, that may be there, but rather just listen, full stop. Just listen to what you hear. And yes, there are clashing of cymbals and drums and screeching of violins, and, and maybe that expresses angst. Or anxiety, and or, and or sadness, and or right. high spirits, and or you know, or fear and and anger, even. Right. And so, so there. Well, so just listen. No, no, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And you know, those things like the bird calls and the thunderstorms, those are novelties, and they can certainly be appreciated. Um, I, I like to liken the the experience of music to the experience of smell another sense mm-hmm. you know we may smell a bad smell we may smell you know something of a sewer but if you know you're from you I know, know we a, do here in Chicago <laughs> walking down the street you know that sewer gas we got to get do something and, with that but know? at the same time yeah. if you happen to be somewhere where you you know that's not the norm and then all of a sudden you smell that similar smell somehow that takes you back to if your home is around that smell. It takes you back to home, and that produces a different kind of sensation. And we actually appreciate those sensations, even though they aren't, quote-unquote, pleasant all the time. 
Um, well, I'm picking up the smell yeah. of baked bread right now, and, <laughs> uh, and that works for me. Now, that's a pleasant smell, and right. we're on, on the happy side of the spectrum. Yeah. Um, but, you know, if I may transition just a, sure. a bit, because uh, you had mentioned to me that your dad was a mm-hmm. composer, mm-hmm. and uh, did he say to you, I mean, I, you know, this has, I mean, our listeners are genuinely interested in your experiences, and, you know, we, most people don't know a lot of composers. We know yeah. truck drivers and lawyers and doctors and all kinds of, right. you know, but most people, and, and so was his advice, don't do it, son, don't do it. <laughs> I'm imagining... I mean, what was that? And then you said you were saying, you know, you did get a piano early on and had right. some. Ex- I would just let's use the term talent in the matter. And, well, and got some, you know, you got some experience. I, there. I think it's, you know, when you're in a musical family, music is inescapable. Um, mm-hmm. You know, it's it's part of your identity. It's part of your experience. And so, I mean, my dad by no means tried to shelter me from the hardships of a life as as, as an artist. I mean, I, there were times when he, you know, when I when I did ultimately decide to be a composer which happened you know after my undergraduate in college I was actually going to you know major you know in piano even get a master's degree in it and I I came back from a trip from Europe incredibly inspired to write and I started writing and then I made my decision and my dad was like you know well I kind of always knew you would end up doing this um and you know there were times when he would tell me you know have a backup plan and you know but but ultimately I mean he knows firsthand that you you can't escape this life if this life really speaks to you and so I mean in that respect I mean uh, my dad and I share quite a lot yeah, um, yeah. you know my, my my dad is definitely a, a musical hero uh, <laughs> you know he's a, a very much admired composer by many and and especially by myself um, and my mom is a, a dancer, and so you know I grew up in this this environment of of creativity, and you know there, you know with all the hardships, there is that ultimate joy and pleasure in the creative act. That, yeah. Well, I mean, I like the part about you know as a parent, being a parent is a tough job on the best of days, and mm-hmm. I know I know you're one of those also. <laughs> yes, you have I a, am. a young son growing up now, and yeah. perhaps not so young anymore, but getting to still of tender age, and. A backup plan makes a lot of sense. Uh, you know, sure. and I know you teach, right? I mean, you are at least from time to time you well, teach. And I would never call teaching a backup plan. Okay, you know, you know it's, thank it's, you. Yeah, it's yeah, it's yeah, all correct, it's all correction. part of it's all part of yeah. the the fabric of the life of, of yeah. somebody who's in the creative arts. I mean, yeah. to teach is to do yeah. as as well. I mean, if you know, when I'm teaching my students, I'm continually learning as I explore deeper and deeper into the music that I'm teaching them, and that informs what I do as a creative person. Uh, likewise, what I do as a creative person helps me to explain to them why Beethoven made the choices that he made. Um, you know, it, it's it, it comes full circle. So I, I just consider you know, that all part of the life. I I would say the backup plan is another field that you may have interest in because, you know, to to be in the musical field, it takes a lot of tenacity because especially if you're, you know, in the classical music industry where, you know, you figure about, you know, a fraction of 1% of the population actually listens to what you do on a regular basis. And our mission is always to, you know, to kind of, open that up and, and, and hopefully introduce more and more people to the, the joys of creating and, and, and enjoy. Well, I, I mean, that is a nice segue to the next question. Uh, what is your guidance as a professor, as a teacher? You have a, a, a mixed class. Let's say it is one of the required classes in music. Yeah. Are there any tips and techniques, lessons learned? We are, our, 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 the audience who listens to this program may indeed, it, it, you know, includes a, a whole spectrum across yeah. the population. So what's your guidance there? Um, first and foremost, I try to lead intuition into analysis. Lead, let me repeat that. Lead intuition into analysis. So what does that mean? Well, that means basically if you think that there's a significant change happening somewhere in a musical piece that you're hearing, you're probably right. You know, you may not necessarily be right on all levels, but you're probably right about something. Um, if, you, you know, if you think you hear a repetition of an idea chances are you probably do, even if it's not exact, but then you can go in and you can really look at the piece of music and start to, you know, take it apart and look at what makes it work. 
um, I find too often people feel at a disadvantage because they don't know what's going on. They don't understand. Like somehow they should have had a background class in this before they got to the class, you know, or before they got to the concert. Yeah. And that's that's not the case at all. I mean, I think, you know, a, a more in-depth study of music stems from, you know, our intuitions about the music and and then leading that to a more intimate relationship with it, ultimately. Well, Here's the thing, you know, we read in the press that the arts get cut back, that budgets are budgets, our times are tough, mm-hmm. and, you know, one of, they look to cut, well, I mean, it's like the arts, and, right. and, and you know, really a shocking number of things. Uh, working in alphabetical order, it's really a scandal, <laughs> right? Uh, I mean, um, and yet, I mean, what I want to say is music opens up whole areas of the brain that we don't otherwise have access to. Right. And how, I mean, I don't know if that you have the magic answer or silver bullet here, but how do we make that case <laughs> to the funding authorities? I mean, well, and, any thoughts on that? Let's brainstorm here. Yeah, for well, I mean, I think that would you know take a lot longer than what we have here because, I mean, we certainly have continued to brainstorm this. I mean, there are studies being done at uh, Northwestern in the neuroscience department showing the benefits of listening to and actively participating in music and what that does for the brain over time. And they've shown significant results that anybody who's involved in music regularly ages, their mind ages better. That they, you know, they're, you know, they're more facile, they're, they're quicker, they're, um, they're able to hear and understand more readily what other people are saying. And, um, and, and, it's certainly been shown, too, that to a certain extent, this has a, an impact on a child's ability to learn as well. And it, you know, hits certain language centers that, you know, excite certain neural centers that open up learning yeah. possibilities. So the, I think the key to making this all relevant to the funding sources that be, though, is having a platform where scientists and musicians are really collaborating and doing presentations that are dynamic, that are emotional and not just um, fact presenting. Well, I know when I was a kid coming up, and I won't say how long ago that's been, we would sing every day. Yeah. I mean, and I'm not saying the quality of the music, but there was singing every week and some singing every day. Yeah. And uh, this is so bad. Look at how smart I got. No, no, no. no. I mean, the point is uh, we're coming up on the end of the hour here, and we really, there's like so many things and so many areas to explore. But if we're educating, if we're educating not merely for performing a task, but for solving problems which we haven't necessarily defined. Right. What then? Right. Well, I mean, ultimately, the the performance and the creation of music involves a kind of thinking where you don't have a ready-made solution. You have to find solutions. Um, as a composer, I mean, that's all I do is I find solutions to problems and and undefined problems. I have to define those problems myself. Um, and I think everybody in the creative and performing arts has to do that to a certain extent. And that kind of critical thinking is really what drives nations, drives civilizations, what makes us become better. On that point, Misha, I have to thank you for your participation, really engaging conversation. My special guest today has been Misha Zupko, musician, teacher, composer. Next week, we have a engaging show lined up. My special guests will be doctors Jesse Viner and Dale Monroe Cook, who are in action counseling, guiding emerging adults in their yellow brick program, not to be missed by parents. We'll see you next week. for tuning in to A Rumor of Empathy with Lou Augusta. Please join us again next Wednesday at 10 a.m. Pacific Time, 1 p.m. Eastern Time on the Voice America Empowerment Channel. We hope to see you again next week.